well, as, as we've talked about throughout this series, if you ever had to go to a counselor, what better counselor could you imagine than Jesus himself, who in the book of Isaiah is called the Wonderful Counselor? So this whole series is about imagining going through life, facing a struggle, going through a hard time, going to see a counselor, and the counselor sitting next to you is Jesus. I believe Jesus would lead you into all kind of conversations. He would press on areas that you might not want to be pressed on. He might say, I know you're saying the issue is this, but I'm pretty sure it's not because I made you and the issue is this. And you'd argue with him because I know a lot of people go to counselors and argue with the counselors. But eventually, I think what Jesus would do, he'd say, okay, you don't agree with me. You don't see it that way. Let me ask you a question. Jesus was a master at asking questions, and so this whole series is about learning about the questions that Jesus would ask as our counselor to get to the issues of our life, because as we've learned throughout this series, the best counselors don't just provide the best answers, they ask the best questions. So we've looked at questions like, do you want to get well? Great, you're here, you say you want to find healing and wholeness and, and deal with issues of your life, but do you really want to get well? Do you want to do the hard work? Do you want to change. We talked about what concern is that of yours? Why are you comparing your calling and what God has placed on your life to somebody else? We've talked about why are you so afraid? What is it that terrifies you so much that you're not willing to step out in faith? Why don't you trust me? We talked last week about how many loaves do you have? What is it that God has given to you? What is it that he's given to you, and why don't you use it? So this, this morning, we're going to wrap up this series, and we're going to look at a question that's probably one of the biggest areas that counselors have to deal with all the time, feelings of guilt, shame, condemnation. When, when someone says, I'm just a total failure, I have no value, I'm not good, uh, I, I, I've, I've messed up, what, what, what can I contribute I, I've just made a mess of my life. I, I, I just don't know if I have anything that I can do. This is because, of, because of mess ups, because of mistakes, because of things that we've done. I believe counselors deal with the issue of guilt, shame, and condemnation. Even when someone would say to them, oh, I don't wrestle with guilt, shame, or condemnation. I believe most of us do. I believe most of us do, and we don't even realize it because we mask it in a lot of ways. So if we went to Jesus, what would he say if, if we were faced with, with these things? So there's this encounter that Jesus has, and it's a remarkable encounter. It's recorded for us in the Gospel of John, and here's how it starts. It says, early in the morning, he, being Jesus, Jesus came again to the temple. Now, keep note of this. It's early in the morning. Something happened the night before. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. So it's early in the morning, and we don't know, is this woman, she's been in a rendezvous all night long, is she trying to sneak out now, go back to her home? Is she married, or is the man she was with married? We don't know, but we know that throughout the night something happened. She was in this adulterous relationship, this affair. She was in an in, in a intimate moment with someone who was not her husband, and one or the other or both of them were married to someone else. And they find out about this, they, uh, they apprehend her, they bring her. Uh, we often get the picture that they throw her at Jesus' feet, and they may have. It doesn't say that. They just put her in the midst, and she's standing there. And they say, now this woman's been caught in adultery. What are we supposed to do? The law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. She should be put to death. What do you say? This they asked him as a test, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So what that basically means is they said, okay, this is what the law says. If he says, don't stone, don't stone her, then he's basically setting aside the law. If, if he says, stone her, they'll say, I'm whose testimony? You can't bring a charge unless you have two or three witnesses. So they're trying to catch him. If he says stoner, he's, they, then they're going to say, you've 
overstep your boundaries. And if he says, don't stone her, they're going to say, you set aside the law. They're trying to trap him. So Jesus standing there, this woman is standing right there. He's looking eyeball to eyeball with her. The crowds in, in an uproar, the scribes and Pharisees are saying all this stuff. And what does Jesus do? He stoops down and begins to write with his finger on the ground, in the dirt, in the dust. And as they continue to ask him, he stood up. So they're just saying, well, what should we do? What should we do? And he's writing. We don't know what he's writing. The Bible never tells us. There are people who will tell you maybe it was such, maybe it was this, maybe it was the sins of the people that were accusing the woman, maybe it was, I don't know, the Ten Commandments. We don't know. But he stands up and he says to them, let him who is, is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Then again, he bent down and began writing in the ground. Again, we, we, we assume he's writing something. What if he's just drawing? What if he's just drawing a stick figure? What if he's drawing the cross? And they have no understanding what the cross will even mean, but what if he's drawing a picture of the cross? But... When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So Jesus stands up, looks at her, and says, woman, where are they? Now, here's the question that I believe he would ask you. Here's the question he would ask me, any of us, if we were sitting in that counseling room. Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Jesus stands up, looks at her, and says, has no one condemned you? Here's, here's what I think the issue is. She can look and say, there's no one that's condemned me, but I condemn myself. I know what I've done. Sure, there's no one here that condemns me. I believe that's one of the reasons Jesus adds on, then neither do I condemn you. If no one condemns you and I don't condemn you, stop condemning yourself. But so often we say, I know what I've done. I know what I've done. Okay, they may not condemn me. You may not condemn me. How do I stop condemning myself? And I believe that's the issue that so many of us carry because we all know Listen, I don't care how transparent you tell me you are. I know people say, I put everything out on the table. You lie, you lie, you lie. No one is 100% transparent. It go Self-preservation is natural in us. It's why at the first sin, what did Adam and Eve do? After they sinned, they hid. We will constantly try and hide what we've done, even if everyone else knows. There are things that you've thought. There are things that you've done. There are things that you have attempted to do that you have never, ever, 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 ever told anyone. And you never will. And so we carry self-condemnation. Self-condemnation is simply this. Self-condemnation is holding on to shame from the past. Holding on to shame, to guilt, it may be something you've done. It may be something that someone did to you. It may be something from your recent past, and it may be something from your distant past, but somehow or other, you say, I just can't let go of this. I'm a failure. I'm a fraud. I'm a fake. If people ever found out, people have found out, and they say they forgive me, but I just, I know. I know what they think because I know what I think of myself. See, most of the time when you think other people are, are saying this about you, thinking this about you, projecting it on you, you're projecting your own thoughts on them. They must be thinking this about me because I'm thinking it about me. It's self-condemnation. So where does that come from? Where does self-condemnation stem from? It can stem from a lot of different areas. We're not going to really get into all of them. I just want to touch on a few. One is this. Self-condemnation can stem from comparisons. And we talked about earlier in the series about not comparing your calling. But I mean comparisons that you make about yourself to other people or that people make about you. Why? Why can't you be more like your sister? Oh, she's the one who's got it all together. Why, why, why aren't you the... You're, clearly, you're not the man your father was. We compare ourselves, why I'm not, I wish I was more like him, I wish I was more like her. 
We compare ourselves. I wish I was taller. I wish I was shorter. I wish I was less round. I wish I was more round. Whatever it is, physical stature, we compare ourselves. We, we have all these ways in which we compare who we are, success. If I was more successful, sometimes even comparing what we do with our success. I feel guilty because I'm successful and I have resources and then I see people that are out there struggling and there's the hurting and, and horror and pain of humanity and I feel guilty that I don't do more. And anytime, 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 anytime we're made to feel inferior, it will bring feelings of guilt and shame, self, self-condemnation. I wish I was different. So comparisons can bring self-condemnation. Here's another one. Correction. Now you might say, what does he mean by that? Okay. Maybe you heard this as a child. Maybe you said this as an adult. Child misbehaves, gets angry, takes the toy, smacks the little brother in the head, uh, gets, gets uh, caught in, in something that they were doing and it just jumps to a lie off of their tongue as quick as they could think and they're, they're lying, whatever it is. And, and a well-meaning, loving adult says to them, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Aren't you ashamed of yourself for acting like that? Aren't you ashamed of yourself for having that attitude? Aren't you ashamed of yourself for saying that? Aren't you ashamed of yourself for behaving that way? But what that person doesn't hear is the back part of the statement. All they hear is, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Self-condemnation. I'm ashamed of myself. I should be ashamed of myself. I am. I am ashamed of myself. And then what happens is they grow up and they wrestle with anger. They wrestle wrestle with lying. They wrestle with uh, an outburst. They wrestle with controlling their tongue, whatever it is. And as soon as they do that or even think about doing it, what comes to their mind is not, I shouldn't do this. I'm ashamed of myself for even having thought about this. I'm ashamed and self-condemnation. I'm just guilty. I'm guilty. I'm always guilty. Nobody will ever see any value in me. So comparisons, correction. Here's another one. Self-condemnation can stem from concealing. There are things that you do, there are things that you think, there are things that you would do if you could get away with it, and you keep it all hidden in the dark recesses of your life, in the shadows. We all have this shadow person, and these shadow thoughts, and they're there, and and we just keep them concealed, but we're we're scared to death. What if somebody ever found out? If somebody ever found out that I thought this, that I did this, I got away with it, I didn't get caught, maybe nobody will ever know, but I know. And so you've concealed all this stuff, these hidden addictions, these hidden thoughts, all these things, and you keep them hidden away, and then someone says, hey, why don't you consider doing this? Oh, I I could never do that. I just couldn't because you've condemned yourself already because of the things that you've kept hidden in the dark. That's why so many times the Bible talks about bring the things in darkness into the light. We think it'll be the end of us. That's the lie of the enemy. Once you bring it into the light, it's not the end of you. It's the beginning of the new you. Yes, it is the end of the old you, but your life won't be, your life won't be terminated. We just think that. So self-condemnation because of what we keep hidden. And then the last thing is this. Self-condemnation can stem from getting caught. Sometimes we feel guilty because we are. (laughs) There are times you've simply done something. You've uh, compromised on a value, on your convictions. You've behaved in some way. The people you're supposed to love the most, you've hurt in some egregious ways. You've overlooked the needs of other people. You've not even looked at them as the dignity of a human. You've trampled all over them. You've lied. You've stolen. You've betrayed a friend. You've violated a confidence in some way. You've cheated. You've stolen. You name it. And you've done all these things, and you get caught. And so you are guilty. And then you carry around with you the ongoing why did I do that? If only I hadn't. If only I hadn't. If only I hadn't. 
And we all can point to all the areas of self-condemnation and we can echo the words of Paul in Romans chapter 7. He said, wretched man that I am, oh, who can free me from this body of death? Because all of us can point to those moments of self-condemnation. Oh, wish I hadn't done that. So what is the answer? What is the answer? Jesus looks at this woman caught in the act of adultery. And there's a lot of ways you can read that. Was she wandering away from the home that she had an affair in? Or did they grab her from the warm bed with the man's arm still wrapped around her? Why didn't they bring the man? I don't know. I know this. There's shame there. There's deep shame. And yet he says, Nobody's here to condemn you. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? I don't condemn you. Stop condemning yourself. Stop. But it's so incredibly difficult. Here's what Paul writes later in Romans chapter 8. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Everyone say no condemnation. So you have a little bit of condemnation. It's fine. You know, just a side of condemnation. And the main course is condemn. No, there is no condemnation. If you're joining us online, put in the chat, no condemnation. There's no condemnation. The question is, how can that be? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the key. But we have to move beyond the emotion of feeling condemned and walk in the truth that we're not condemned. Now, the key to finding the freedom from self-condemnation is the part that says, for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you want freedom from condemnation, you have to get to the point where you say, I am going to stand in the presence of Jesus, just like that woman, look him eyeball to eyeball and realize I'm not condemned. I'm not condemned. And then Jesus says, now go and sin no more. You don't have to live like this. You're not condemned, and you don't have to be condemned. You can be free from condemnation. Forgiveness in Christ brings freedom from condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, forgiveness in Christ. God, through Jesus Christ, looks at you and says, I don't condemn you. I forgive you. I don't condemn you. I extend grace. I don't condemn you. Here's my mercy. Here's my love. I forgive you. I don't condemn you. No one has condemned you. Accept yourself. Now, what you'll hear sometimes, what you'll read sometimes, what you'll see on uh, blogs and internet posts and every such thing is that if you want to find freedom from condemnation, from self-condemnation, you have to learn to forgive yourself. Now, I understand what they mean by that. I'm not dissing anybody. I'm just here to tell you that's not the answer. You can't even really forgive yourself. God forgives you. Jesus forgives you. If you're forgiven by Christ, you're forgiven. You're either forgiven or you're not. If he's declared you innocent, do you need to now declare over yourself? I know God said I'm innocent, but I'm like a little bit higher than God. I mean, God said I'm innocent, but until I say I'm innocent, until I say I'm not guilty, until I can forgive myself, it borderlines blasphemy. Think about this. God's forgiven me, but not me. Really? So the key is not to say, I need to forgive myself. Because forgiveness is found in Jesus, not in you. Forgiveness is found in Jesus, not in you. Forgiveness is found in Jesus, not in you. The key is not to find the ability to forgive yourself. The key is the ability to receive the forgiveness that Christ offers. And then say, I'm not condemned. I'm not condemned, and remind yourself time and time again, I'm not condemned. I have been set free. So you hear the voice of the crowd. You hear the voices in your mind. You hear the voices in your heart that say, I know what you did. I know what you thought. I know how you behaved. I know all those things. And at some point, you have to quiet all those voices and hear the voice of the one who loves you. Hear the voice of the one who died for you. Hear the voice of the one who's drawing in the sand whatever he is. Some people say he was writing the sins of all those who were accusing the woman. And as they looked at their own sins, they left. Some people tell you he was writing the sins of the woman. And she's looking at it horrified. I thought I was only guilty of adultery. And he's writing all her sins. And he says, now, 
wipes them away with his foot, go and sin no more. But I said, maybe he's, maybe he's drawing a picture of the cross. Maybe he's writing forgiveness. Maybe he's writing sacrifice. Maybe he's writing greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. I don't know what he's writing. But at some point, you have to quiet all those voices that say you're guilty, you're condemned, even your own voice, and hear the voice of him who says, I don't condemn you. And if God, who is holy and just and never sinned and who is perfect in every way, says, I don't condemn you, who are you to condemn yourself? We have to get to that point. Forgiveness through Christ allows us to walk free from condemnation. It's not finding the magic formula of forgiving yourself, of loving yourself, of accepting yourself. It's saying, really, it's, at some level, you understand forgiving yourself is, an, is, is a way in which we can um, excuse our sin. I just have to forgive myself. I just can't help it. It's who I am. It's how I was made. God forbid we go on sinning that grace might abound. That's what Paul writes in Romans 6. He says, no, no, no. Be forgiven. Now go and sin no more. I forgive you. I forget, I don't condemn you, but don't live like this anymore. You don't have to live. You can live free from condemnation. So Paul, one last time, writes this in Romans, the end of Romans chapter 8. So we read in 8.1, 8, um, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Later on in that same chapter, this is what he writes. Who then is the one who condemns? Everyone say it. No one. Everyone say it. No. Who condemns? Can you condemn? No, you're a, no one can condemn. We think we hold on to that right. But it says no one condemns. Why? Because Christ Jesus died. More than that, he was raised from the dead. And this Christ Jesus who died is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. If Christ is for you, who can be against you? If Christ is saying, I don't condemn you, no one can condemn you. Not the voice of your mother-in-law, not the voice of your children, not the voice of the ex-spouse, and not your own voice. No one can condemn you. So, come to Christ and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I, I did this. I don't want to do this anymore. He forgives you. He says, now, go and sin no more. How do we walk free from condemnation? So there's three things I want to mention, and it's this. First, do not allow forgiven sin. Listen, if you haven't come to Christ and asked forgiveness, if you haven't stood in his midst and said, I did this, I know I did this, I'm guilty, and allow him to forgive you, you will walk in condemnation. But do not allow forgiven sin to condemn you. It's been forgiven. At some point... At some point, you have to say, this has been forgiven. So here's a test. If you can't share what your past, the past story, that thing that you're so ashamed of, if you can't share it, if you can't share it, it will continue to condemn you. Everyone I ever meet says, I want a testimony. I want to be able to give a testimony, share a wonderful thing that God did in my life. Hey, tell them about how you used to live this lifestyle. And what happened and the things you did and how he set you free. I can't share that. I'm so embarrassed by it. Then it will continue to condemn you. If you won't share that testimony. Listen, it's not easy. It's not fun. I'm not saying you have to share it to everyone that you meet at every moment that you meet them. But at some point, I knew a man who had lived a, a promiscuous lifestyle. And, and fathered a number of children before he came to Christ. And for the longest time, he didn't want to tell anybody. He ended up becoming a Christian, changed his life, got married, had a family. Everything was good. And he, I, I just, oh, if my kids ever find out. And I said, if they ever find out what? If they ever find out what? Oh, I'll be so embarrassed. I'll be so ashamed. I said, well, let it stop condemning you. Just tell them. I said, no. They're three years old. Probably not the best time to have the conversation. Hey, Junior, let me tell you. Um, but you tell them as they get into their... You know, or, uh, adolescent years. Tell them, Daddy's not proud of this. I'm not glad I did this. But let me tell you, this is who I was. And God set me free. 
and I'm forgiven. And I'm not that person anymore. And God can redeem any mistake that you've made, any mess that you've made, and God can use it for good. So just share your story. If you can't share, I know people that have, have stolen, have embezzled funds, have lied and cheated, done all kinds of things. And until you're willing to share that story, even if it's been forgiven, it will condemn you. So don't allow forgiven sin to condemn you. Share your story. Shout it from the rooftops. Look what God has done. Look what God has done. The next thing uh, is this. So until, until, I mentioned this, until you are willing to share your story, it will continue to condemn you. Until you're willing to talk about your past. The next thing is this. Do not allow forgiven sin to keep you from moving forward. You've been forgiven. Why are you allowing to hold you back? Think about the great saints in the Bible. Almost all of them have major monumental fails. And yet their stories are recorded for us. So their testimony is there. And beyond that, after they've messed up, after they've come to God, after they've been forgiven, they're used in great ways. The greatest thing you will do for God will always, always, always follow forgiveness. The greatest way that God wants to work through you is because you've come to a point of saying, forgive me. And you've moved on past allowing the condemnation to hold you back. Think about Moses. Moses murders someone, tries to hide the body, and is then scared of getting found out, and, and Pharaoh is going to kill him. So he runs away and hides for 40 years. But he doesn't, eventually, he doesn't allow that to hold him back. God shows up and says, now I want you to be the great deliverer of my people. Jonah, God says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach. I want to see 95, 100,000 people come to faith. I want to see a great revival. And he runs away from God, says, I'd rather them die than them to get saved. But God uses him. God forgives him. He doesn't live in condemnation. He goes and preaches and the whole city is saved. And then God deals with his Arrogance and pride and only way that God could. Think about Paul. Paul was in favor of persecuting the church and watching Christians put to death. Kill them. It's fine by me. I think it's a nifty idea. Kill all the Christians. And yet God uses him as a pillar in the church, one of the foundational apostles who wrote most of the books of the New Testament. There's uh, David, right? Great King David. God makes a covenant with David and says, They'll never, you'll never lack a descendant to sit on the throne of Israel. And then what does David do? He has an affair, he commits adultery, and he has the woman's husband murdered to try and cover it up. And he could have lived in self-condemnation and said, but he moved forward. Peter, Peter denied even knowing Jesus. I don't know, I've never met the man. I don't know what you're talking about. And yet Jesus builds a church on Peter. He is the, the foundational apostle. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, and then there's Peter. So the point is, at some point, you have to say, this is my story. I've been forgiven. I will not allow forgiven sin to condemn me, and I will not allow forgiven sin to hold me back. I've shared my story with you all. I'm not going to get into all the, the details of it, but in my life, 19 years old, fell head over heels in love with a young woman by the name of Jamie Bendinelli, and we allowed the biological impulses of our bodies to override the voice of the Holy Spirit, and we ended up uh, finding out that she was pregnant at 19 years old, and we're not married. Uh, I'm in college, she's in college, and it felt like the life was going to be over, but God's grace his forgiveness, and then say, you know what, okay, this happened, it's my story, I share it when I need to, but I did not and I would not allow the condemnation of forgiven sin to hold me back. God had a future, he had a call, and it may have changed the path in which I had to walk to get there, but God, <laughs> I can make a new path, that's easy. I can make a path where there is no path, I can make a way where there seems to be no way, if you won't, let it Hold you back. And then the last thing is this. Do not, do not, do not allow forgiven sin to keep you from worshiping. 
Don't allow forgiven sin to keep you from worshiping. Jesus said to the woman who's standing there in his presence, now go and sin no more. I believe the greatest way in which we can achieve holiness of life is being in God's presence, spending time looking at Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, that at some point we say, I'm in God's presence, and as I look at Jesus and worship him in all his glory, in all his splendor, and I understand who he is, he'll change me, and he'll transform me, and I'll become more like him, and I won't have to sin like this anymore. And I've got a testimony I could share. I can move forward in Christ and I can lift up my hands and say, God, I'm forgiven. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus said, he who has been forgiven much loves much. I believe what part of that is you love others much and you love God much. And when you learn to love the Lord like that, what will hold you back from worshiping him? I believe self-condemnation keeps us from entering into worship because we say, I'm not worthy to come into God's presence. But listen to me, if you've been forgiven, if you've asked for grace, if you've fallen at the feet of Jesus and said, I know what I did and I'm sorry, he says, I don't condemn you. Stop condemning yourself. Lift up your hands, lift up your voice and worship me. And it ought to compel us to worship. But when we allow self-condemnation to keep us from worshiping God, it holds us back from the greatest, most intimate moment we can have with our Heavenly Father. Being in His presence, declaring His goodness, standing in His grace. So here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask if you'd stand with me. We just read in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who can condemn you? No one. No one. So if you close your eyes and bow your heads, ask, ask yourself, who is it that condemns me? Who is it? Is it the voice of a friend, a family member, an acquaintance, that boss from years ago, that spiritual leader? What's that voice that condemns you? If you've never come and asked Christ for forgiveness, then you need to understand there is another voice speaking. It's the voice of conviction. And that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice that says, I want to forgive you. Just ask. Just come to me and ask. So if you've never come to that point of faith in Jesus Christ, what you may be hearing is not the voice of a friend, a voice of a neighbor, a voice of a family member. It may be the voice of the Holy Spirit. And you know those things you've done. And you know you need forgiveness. You know you need grace. You know you need to kneel at Jesus' feet. Stand in his presence. Look him in the eyes and say, I'm guilty. I am guilty. But I don't want to be. And he will give you forgiveness. And then he'll say, I don't condemn you. See, Jesus lived a perfect life. And he died a horrible death to forgive the sins of all mankind, of all humanity, your sins and my sins. And if that's the voice you're hearing, the voice of conviction calling you right now, and you want to place your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never done that before, you want to say, I want to hear him say, I no longer condemn you, I don't condemn you, neither do I condemn you. Then right where you are, just raise your hand. If you're joining us online, just lift your hand that says, I want to accept Christ and I want to lead you in a simple little prayer. I'm going to ask everyone, whether you've raised your hand or not, to repeat this prayer after me. But if you're praying this and you mean it, there's, it's not the exact words that matter. It's the heart. It's the attitude in which you say them. Understanding that you're, you're asking God's forgiveness. So if everyone would just repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you now. And I ask you to forgive me. Take away all my sins all my guilt, all my shame, all my condemnation, and set me free. I give you my life, and I receive new life in Christ. I am a new creation. The old has gone, and the new has come. Allow me to hear your voice saying to me, I do not condemn you. I do not condemn you. 
stop condemning yourself. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you have placed your faith and your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. You are part of God's family. And what I'm going to ask is when our gathering is done, just come forward, allow someone to pray with you and pray for you. If you're joining us online, click the button so we can follow up with you. But now, for those of you that would say, I still hear a voice of condemnation. Even though I know it says no one can condemn me. What voice is that? Is it yours? Is it a friend's? Whosoever voice that is, I think when we get down to it, we may hear it as someone else's voice, but at the end of the day, it's our voice condemning ourselves. And if you would say, I no longer want to walk in condemnation. I no longer want to walk in self-condemnation. I want to be free to share my story. I want to be free to move forward with who Christ has called me to, and I want to be free to worship him because he's forgiven me. If you just one last time bow your heads, I want to pray. And when this song is done, when this song is done, we're going to go into a time of worship. And, and if you've never done this, I'm, going to, I'm just going to encourage you with some things, but just enter into worship and celebrate your freedom in Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have set us free, free from sin, free from death, free from condemnation. If you don't condemn us, but instead you sit at God's right hand making intercession for us. Who can condemn us? No one. No one can condemn us. Not the voice of a stranger, not the voice of a friend, not the voice of a, the most intimate family member, and God, not our own voice. So I'm asking, would you silence the voice of condemnation? And instead, would we hear you speaking to us? Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Who can condemn you? No one. Who can condemn you? No one. Who can condemn you? No one. Because you're forgiven in Christ. Now let's worship him together. <laughs>